Uh, first thing I'd like to do is acknowledge uh, my co-workers, Jason Frank and Charles Maxwell uh, in Animal Sciences, Cash East from the Applied Sustainability Center at the University of Arkansas, <coughs> and Darren Nutter from the Department of Mechanical Engineering. So uh, let's get the first thing out of the way first. Why are we doing this? Uh, well, there are a number of reasons. Uh, Bill mentioned some of them, but I, I, I'd like to elaborate a little bit. Economy, not so great. <coughs> how, do we, how do we survive in, in less than uh, nice economic times? One way is we look for efficiencies because carbon emissions are so closely tied to energy consumption, uh, looking at the life cycle of swine production provides an opportunity to identify efficiencies and uh, improve the bottom line. Resource conservation. Sustainability is a buzzword today. Everybody knows it, everybody hears it. We see uh, increasingly scarce resources and we need, again, efficiencies to help us manage those resources for the long term so that we can continue to uh, grow and prosper. <clears throat> I, I put this bullet on there because of my uh, long-running disagreement with many economists who seem to say that uh, despite the loss of manufacturing in the United States, that we can bootstrap ourselves uh, with innovation in the service sector. <laughs> it's just crazy to me. Uh, and, and when I thought about it, I, I start thinking about what are the, the fundamental renewable resources that we in this country have. Uh, mining? Not so much. We got a lot of coal, but there's some uh, significant resistance against using that. Uh, we're finding more and more and more natural gas, which, while a fossil fuel is a little bit better than coal and oil, but to me, fundamentally, the thing that is going to be really important as we move into the next 50 years is agriculture. Anything that we can do to understand the agricultural system and make it better, I think, is really important to do at this juncture. Lastly, uh, as Bill indicated, consumers do care. <clears throat> I come from uh, Fayetteville, Arkansas, which is 30 miles south of the uh, center of the known universe, uh, Walmart's headquarters. <clears throat> They, uh, you may well be aware, are uh, heavily pushing sustainability metrics and indices. Uh, and by performing this work, the pork industry is positioning itself in a proactive space to uh, fend off any criticism that may come uh, down the road. So there's a number of reasons that this is important um, that don't have anything to do with greenhouse gases. <clears throat> What I want to cover today, uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with life cycle assessment, so I'm going to give a quick overview of what LCA is, uh, talk about the goal and scope of this particular project, um, kind of define the conceptual model that is the basis for uh, uh, the calculations and results that I'll show because you really have to understand uh, what we're thinking about when we construct these models. Some scenario analyses discussion of uncertainty and sensitivity. Don't believe anybody that tells you the carbon footprint of X is 10. <clears throat> it's not. It's 10 plus or minus something. And if they don't give you the plus or minus, they're not telling you the whole story. The national scan results and some concluding remarks. Calculating a carbon footprint requires a full system scale analysis. And in agriculture, uh, whoops, Wrong button. In agriculture, uh, energy consumption, manure and nutrient management really are the, the biggest pieces of the puzzle. Energy consumption, obviously. Uh, manure, because the uh, uh, management systems for manure uh, result, there are biological conversions of the, the manure material that result in the release of greenhouse gases. Uh, and nutrient management, which is of course closely tied to manure management, but also implies um, management of 
uh, cropping systems because of the application of nitrogen fertilizers and the nitrification denitrification cycle that occurs uh, resulting in release of nitrous oxide which is a potent greenhouse gas. To be compliant with international standards the uh, LCA has to start with extractions from nature. What does that mean? It means that if I have uh, an electrical pump for my irrigation, that what I have to account to be fully compliant with uh, ISO international standards is all the way back to the diesel that ran the drag line that pulled the coal out of the ground, the diesel that hauled it by rail to the plant where it was burned and the emissions that occurred there. So. The LCA is big. <clears throat> uh, a good friend of mine says uh, uh, life cycle assessment is not rocket science, <clears throat> and his implication is that it's really pretty simple because you just have to account for a few little things here and there. Uh, but after a while of doing this, I, I just wish it were as simple as rocket science because the, the systems are so intertwined and complicated and trying to keep track of everything is, is, is really a challenge. The tool that we use is life cycle assessment. Um, it, it provides a framework for doing these calculations. Life cycle assessment consists broadly of four phases, uh, goal and scope definition, uh, why are we doing it, what do we expect, how are we going to use the results, uh, a, a significant amount of effort on inventory, which is collecting all of the uh, uh, what we call elementary flows, so how much electricity is used for X, Y, or Z activity in the supply chain, how much diesel is consumed for transportation. All of the little pieces of that puzzle have to be accounted uh, in the inventory. For greenhouse gases, impact is fairly straightforward. You simply sum up the total uh, quantity of greenhouse gases emitted and report that as uh, kilograms of carbon dioxide equivalent. <clears throat> Interpretation, okay, we've got all this uh, new knowledge of our system, what does it mean? How do we use that? We try to find hot spots in the system that are, are hopefully ripe for innovation uh, and uh, move forward. And the reason for all of these arrows is that this whole process is not linear. It, it doesn't happen all that often that you revise the goal and scope, but sometimes you, you will revise the goal and scope based on what you find as you've begun doing the work. <clears throat> but certainly the interpretation and impact assessment can lead to uh, you know, the need for additional inventory data and it can then affect everything else. The structure of an LCA is based on what uh, we call unit processes. So we have a series of linked unit processes. This one is fairly uh, simple, it's linear, but uh, you can imagine that um, there's lots of loops in the, the whole economy because you have to have electricity to do just about everything and uh, to extract coal you've got to have electricity. To get electricity you have to have coal so it's, it's circular in that manner. This doesn't show that but uh, the models that we construct uh, try to account for that. Uh, in, the, in the biggest sense what we're interested in is uh, summing up all of the extractions from the environment and all of the releases to the environment done uh, unit process by unit process. And so inputs can be coming typically from another unit process. The output of a swine farm is pigs that go to the processor. <clears throat> the output of the processor is rendering products uh, and dressed carcass or packaged meat. <coughs> uh, there may or may not be extractions from the environment. If your, uh, if your farm has a natural gas well, then you would have a direct extraction from the environment. If you take propane delivered, that's another unit process. We have to keep track of all of this stuff. At the end, uh, we can identify hot spots and probably at some time in the future, uh, in fact already in the UK I understand, product labels. This is the carbon footprint of that tube of toothpaste. <clears throat> I won't spend much time on this slide, but the hallmark of the work that we're doing at the University of Arkansas is uh, openness and transparency. Everything that I do, anybody who wants to can see all of it. Um, the reason that that's important is that there are many different 
places where assumptions have to be made in, in doing the accounting, and they're not always done, not always made exactly the same way by everybody. And so, if you have uh, system A and system B, and you want to make a comparison, and you don't know what's happened back behind the scenes, all you have are the top level numbers. You can't really make that comparison. So, uh, transparency uh, is critical, and of course, uh, you know. Everybody ought to be using the same data sets and models, uh, again, for that uh, comparability. So turning then to the uh, project today, the life cycle analysis for swine, we need to know what the system is. Uh, we also have to have a clear goal and scope. Uh, it's fairly straightforward in this case. Determine the greenhouse gas emissions associated with delivery and consumption of a serving of pork. <clears throat> it's cradle to grave. I already mentioned extractions from nature going all the way back for the electricity uh, and includes uh, package disposal. So the, uh, the styrofoam plate and the absorbent pad, the shrink wrap, all of that stuff goes somewhere. What are the greenhouse gas implications of that? Uh, let me let me just point out. Um, I probably already used the. Uh, I'm, do I need to move my microphone? Is is it going up and down too much, or is it okay? Because I occasionally I'm getting feedback. And I'm not sure if I'm doing something different. Okay. I'm sorry. Uh, greenhouse gases. What we're talking about are carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, and refrigerants primarily. They are expressed, uh, and I'll use this term uh, from now on, as carbon dioxide equivalents. The, um, uh, the, the, the ability of different gases to trap infrared radiation, the greenhouse business, uh, is different because of different molecular structures and, and scientists have uh, made equivalencies and so we add them all up together and report them uh, as CO2 equivalents. Here's a schematic of the system. Uh, it has seven major um, sections uh, from feed production through consumption and disposal. The uh, red up at the top represents inputs of uh, energy or materials that uh, carry a greenhouse gas burden because of their production or use. Uh, down the center are the, the activities which occur that, that use these resources. And in these uh, lighter green boxes are the places where greenhouse gases uh, can be emitted. Um, I, I mentioned that life cycle assessment is an accounting, uh, and because of that, there are accounting decisions that are made, and I've highlighted four locations where uh, an allocation of burdens uh, occurs. In crops, uh, there's a lot of uh, crop byproducts particularly distillers grains and soybean meal in, in the case of swine that are that are used <clears throat> so why, why does that matter we know what we know about soybeans we just feed them in no it doesn't work that way because the soybeans go to a, a processing facility and there's lots of extra energy and, and other resources that are used to separate the beans and the meal both have value and so how do I assign the burden of that processing to the beans and the meal. What we've done is, uh, as a base case, taken economics, uh, economic value as that uh, the metric by which we separate those burdens. Likewise, at rendering, the, uh, the packaging plant has multiple products. We have to assign burden, some burden to the meat, some burden to the other products. How do we do that? Uh, retail and consumer, likewise, pork doesn't take up all of the refrigerated space in the store, and so we have to make that allocation because, well, we don't really know how much electricity went for that, you know, <laughs> little slice right there. We have to be able to account that. Okay, I promise we're going to get to the real stuff here pretty soon. But you have to understand the basis of our thinking so that the numbers make more sense. Uh, about 67% of the total burden happens by the time we've reached the farm gate. And so I want to explain how we've uh, oops, modeled the, uh, the farm. Uh, this doesn't represent all farms, obviously. We've got a, a, a two barn system, a sow barn, and a nursery finish barn. The sow barn has inputs of energy feed and gilts, uh, providing piglets 
uh, as then energy and feed flow into the nursery finished barn, finished pigs flow out, and there are emissions and manure at both of those phases. <coughs> What we've done is we've, we've taken as our uh, basis for this calculation uh, one sow's productive life. So one sow from gilt until uh, she goes to market uh, produces X and however many pigs that ultimately are finished. We track all of that through, keeping track of all of the energy and all of the feed that go into that whole system to get all of those pigs out to market. Add that up and ultimately then uh, divide by the total quantity of uh, meat that was produced at the farm gate to get the footprint. So some assumptions. Obviously not every uh, sow has 9.5 piglets per litter. In fact probably there's not a sow been born that had 9.5 piglets per litter, right? <laughs> But on average, uh, whoops, excuse me, I keep pushing the wrong button. Uh, the thing about technology is that you have to outsmart it a lot of times. So uh, three and a half liters per sow, 268 pounds finished weight, uh, conversions from uh, live to carcass to boneless. Uh, we assumed a typical meal. We did include some of the uh, smaller supplements, the dical, which is a little bit different, or monocal, which is a little bit different if you do or don't have distiller's grains. Uh, we've used the uh, ASAB, Biological Engineering Standard Manure Characteristics for Swine. Uh, IPCC is the inter, uh, Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Control. They've published uh, standards for how you handle manure, manure management systems. So the emission factor says if I've got a kilogram of manure, I can expect uh, 0.2 kilograms of methane if I use a deep pit or some other uh, management system. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to touch on biogenic carbon. The question always arises. Um, that's a good idea. I'll turn mine off too. <clears throat> the question uh, arises, are you accounting for the uh, sequestration of the carbon as the crops grow? And, and our answer is no, not at this time. And the reason for that is that the, uh, while the scientific community has uh, pretty clearly demonstrated that sequestration of carbon does occur, can occur over decades or for grasslands, perhaps even centuries, uh, it is highly dependent upon the tillage practice and we don't have a good database for all of the tillage practices that are used for all of the commodity crops and so we're assuming for the moment that there is no uh, net sequestration uh, at the crops. As we develop models that are more uh, site specific and we do have that data, that information about how much uh, land is tilled in which manner, we can begin to account for that uh, more carefully. The advantage and advantage, uh, by not counting that, we don't have to model uh, carbon dioxide that the animals are breathing, nor do we have to model the carbon dioxide that uh, you would breathe after you ate a pork chop. If you count the sequestration at the crop level, then you have to count all of that other stuff where it goes back to the atmosphere. We've assumed 10% uh, uneaten or spoiled. Uh, I've already mentioned this allocation business, uh, uh, economic and space allocation uh, for those spots in the supply chain. Okay, the good stuff. Here's the big picture. The bottom line, 2.2 pounds of carbon dioxide equivalent per four ounce serving cooked and consumed. <clears throat> There's about uh, 20 pounds uh, emitted driving 20 miles in a standard vehicle. A gallon of gas gives off about 20 pounds. This is equivalent to, and, and the rest of my talk will really be uh, using these units, kilograms per kilogram of pork consumed. Uh, it turns out uh, conveniently that there is a uh, simple factor of four to convert between the two. There's a 95% confidence band from 1.8 to 2.7. So if, I, if, if you walk out of here and you tell everybody, hey, it's 2.2 pounds per uh, four ounce serving, and you don't tell them, that it's really somewhere between 1.8 and 2.7, you haven't given the whole story. 
we'll talk about where that range came from in a few minutes. Based on national uh, uh, estimates, uh, about, as I've said, 67% of the burden occurs uh, at the farm gate, another roughly 7% for processing and packaging, and nearly equal distribution between retail and consumption. The primary uh, things, electricity and refrigerants, and the bigger thing uh, at the consumer is cooking. Okay, let's look at this a little bit closer. Where did those numbers come from? What we did is constructed a number of production scenarios and we'll walk through uh, three or four of them uh, to kind of see what it looks like. Before we do that, um, the last time I gave this talk I was criticized for <coughs> not having this slide, so I fixed that. Uh, we'll see a series of network diagrams uh, coming up. Uh, each box in the network diagram represents uh, a unit process. The name of the unit process, uh, either the thing that it's delivering or the thing that it is, the, the process itself is, is labeled. Uh, so this is the finished barn. This, is, this represents what happens in the home. Uh, the top line uh, tells us the uh, reference flow. In this case, it means one kilogram of um, pork consumed, cooked and consumed. Uh, down here, this tells us that in order to get one kilogram of consumed pork, we had to provide 2.05 kilograms live weight at the finish barn. The, the two conversions that we talked about a moment ago, uh, 0.75 and 0.65, get us to that. And in the home, of course, they had to refrigerate one kilogram, and so that's the reason for that. This network diagram is for a, a particular scenario. See it easier if I walk down here. Um, for a deep that. Uh, a deep pit uh, manure management system, uh, you can see that there's seven, which is less than the 8.8 .8 I mentioned earlier because the 8.8 .8 is built up from uh, an estimate of all the management systems that are in use. Uh, I want to point out that coming from the deep pit, this line that goes back to nitrogen fertilizer represents a credit for uh, nitrogen applied to crops that reduces the need for inorganic fertilizer production. So that's, uh, that's a credit. Uh, these, these numbers won't, won't add up uh, to the percentages because, again, it's for a specific uh, scenario. Another way to look at these data is uh, in this diagram where we see the uh, respective contribu contributions of the, the major greenhouse gases at different uh, phases of the supply chain. So primarily uh, fossil fuel and nitrous oxide for the uh, production and use of fertilizer, uh, quite a bit of uh, carbon dioxide, which is gonna be primarily um, fuels. Um, Manure management, mostly methane. Farm operation, again, mostly fuels, probably electricity and some, some propane. Electricity and natural gas. The red bar here is uh, wastewater treatment at the processing facility. Uh, and in the end, retail and consumption, quite a bit of electricity, uh, some uh, uh, refrigerants. And I think this is uh, methane that comes from uh, wastewater treatment, municipal, uh, municipal sewage treatment. The thing that is uh, uh, frankly fascinating to me about this is the, the, the size of this uh, retail and consumption in comparison with these others. It, it really is uh, a non-trivial contribution to the overall supply chain. Look at another of these network diagrams. Uh, I guess one thing I didn't, didn't say is that it should be, I think, obvious the, the width of the bars represents uh, uh, the, the relative impact of that, <coughs> that box. The only thing we changed was looking at a, uh, an anaerobic lagoon instead of a deep pit. You can see that the, uh, the top line number went up by probably 40% uh, from 7 to 10.2, and that the uh, lagoon itself, uh, nearly the, the manure management nearly quadrupled its relative contribution as we see in this slide, uh, big difference. <clears throat> Clearly, 
uh, in terms of reducing greenhouse gas emissions, uh, doing something with the anaerobic lagoons uh, is, a, is a significant opportunity for the swine, the swine industry. I've mentioned allocation a couple of times. <clears throat> it matters. Why does it matter? Because people want to compare this LCA to that LCA. And if all you see is 8.42 and you compare that to 7, there is no difference in the two systems. The earlier one that I showed, the, the base case, deep pit, 1.02 there, every one of those numbers except these two are the same. And the only reason that these two are different is because I chose to allocate by mass instead of economic value. The burdens, you know, the operation of the soybean meal mill didn't change. I just decided, you know, that's why uh, Anderson and Enron got in so much trouble, right? They're playing accounting games. Well, you have to be careful when you make comparisons of life cycle assessments for a number of reasons. One of them is that you've got the same assumptions behind uh, another is that the system boundaries are equivalent. They're not always. So <clears throat> it's important not because it matters to what you might do in terms of finding innovation, but it matters in terms of how you communicate with the public or make comparisons. Let's look at the uh, live swine production. Uh, these numbers are, are not new, but it just kind of focuses in a little bit more closely on uh, getting animals to the farm gate. <clears throat> uh, it's a little bit different because uh, this one's been constructed to show the sow barn is feeding directly into the finished barn and in the other one it was at a, at a parallel level and didn't show up quite the same. If we look here we should see that uh, for 2.05 kilograms uh, live weight at the farm gate, which is the, the live weight necessary to get one kilogram of consumable uh, meat to the consumer, uh, requires about four uh, kilograms, or it, it results in the emission of about four kilograms of carbon dioxide, so two kilograms per kilogram. Uh, on a dressed carcass, bake it, ba dressed carcass basis, that's about 2.7 kilograms per kilogram of dressed carcass, and uh, if we compare that to studies in, that, that have been done in the European Union, uh, the range that they uh, present is between 3 and 5 kilograms per kilogram on a dressed carcass basis. So with the deep pit management system, we're a little bit lower than uh, their lowest reported number. Again, the, the fuzz on those numbers, the uncertainty, probably they're not statistically different. Uh, for uh, the same system with a uh, anaerobic lagoon, that number goes right up near the top to about 4.6 or so, so right in the uh, upper part of the range of the European studies. So we're in uh, rough agreement with uh, swine production uh, in other developed countries. Looking a little more closely at processing, <coughs> the big uh, contributors electricity those uh, the, the data behind these uh, numbers um, came from somewhere uh, in the vicinity of 15 or 17 uh, processing facilities and we uh, averaged all of the production and uh, input uh, data that was reported to get these average numbers and so these represent should represent pretty uh, realistic values for uh, processing the diesel you can see is pretty small. That's uh, what was reported for transport of the live swine from the farm to the processor. What we have found in a number of our studies is that despite the uh, clear importance of transportation to the economies of many of these processes, they just rarely are significant in terms of their greenhouse gas contribution. And so, the, uh, hence the food miles fallacy. So you just, you don't necessarily uh, lower your carbon footprint by eating locally. 
I've already mentioned this, uh, consumption matters. Uh, I changed in this, uh, in this one, you can see it's 7.3 instead of 7. The reason for that is that I changed this from natural gas oven to an electric oven. Electric ovens take a bit longer to heat up and use a little bit more electricity. Uh, in fact, the estimates for uh, consumption for cooking um, pork are something on the order of 2 kilowatt hours one and a half to two kilowatt hours of electricity necessary to, to cook uh, a pork loin. So I don't know what you guys pay for electricity, but I don't know, it's less than 30, less than 30 cents of, of electricity. But it represents nearly two kilowatt hours or one and a half kilowatt hours, I don't remember exactly which one, represents 13 or 14 percent of the whole thing. It's just astonishing to me that, that, that that's the case. It's a bit surprising. Sensitivity and scenario analysis. Uh, real quick uh, overview of the things that I've shown you, the, the, the base case here, uh, and there's not really any new data here. This is the fertilizer feed, manure management, all that stuff just stacked up so that we can see them side by side. Uh, the uh, uh, black bars here represent our best estimate of the 95% confidence band. Obviously from a statistical uh, comparison point of view, these three really couldn't be considered different. <clears throat> but this one certainly is different. And this one certainly looks different, but guess what? That's because of the mass allocation. Again, be aware of how these studies have been conducted because the, the behind the scenes accounting can you know skew the results and, and if we didn't you know if somebody just put this out and said oh look my systems or these guys would say oh my system's lots better than this system well it's really not just because of the accounting so <clears throat> how do we get these bars there's a couple of things that go into uh, uh, trying to assess that. In, in this slide I'm showing uh, the, the farm gate total for, um, it would be 2.05 kilograms of, of live swine produced under different uh, scenarios, a base, and a, low, a base case, a high and a low. What we changed in this analysis was the um, emission factors for the different manure management systems. <clears throat> Ammonia volatilization, volatilization, for example, can range from 15 or 20 percent of the uh, nitrogen in the manure to 80 percent, depending upon conditions. So when it volatilizes, it can then be transformed into a greenhouse gas. So what is the effect of 20% versus 80% release of the nitrogen. What is the difference between um, the biological activity? Part of the difference between the regions in, in, in this slide is because of difference in temperature in the two regions, or the three regions. Um, <clears throat> so, bottom line is, there's about a 25% difference between the max and the min where we took the absolute worst case and the absolute best case. Uh, so from the mean value, maybe plus or minus 15% that's introduced just because we don't have a good uh, knowledge about all of the uh, processes that are occurring. Another way to assess uh, uncertainty and apply those error bars is uh, to first acknowledge that all of the variables have uh, some uncertainty. Um, and we use a, a technique called Monte Carlo simulation. Uh, every parameter in the model has some range of uh, acceptable values and so what you do in a, a Monte Carlo simulation is you pick one for all of them you get the answer. You pick another one you get the answer. You do that uh, we did it in this case uh, 600 times but sometimes it'll be thousands of runs and when you do that what you'll what you'll get is a, a, a a bell curve and the, the, the peak would be the 7.1 and then you can use uh, standard statistics to show what the bound, uh, bounding values should be. Doing that for the pit system gives this result and for the uh, anaerobic lagoon system gives that result. So that's how we uh, uh, assign uncertainty. 
<coughs> excuse me. So uh, I'm going to kind of walk you through uh, the calculations that we did to get to the 8.8 uh, .8 kilograms per kilogram or 2.2 uh, pounds per four ounce serving. Uh, obviously the uh, manure management practices are different in different parts of the country. Uh, we used some data from uh, climate leaders to uh, ascertain that uh, in North Carolina it's about a 50-50 mix, in the upper Midwest closer to a 66-34 and in the Oklahoma Panhandle roughly the same as in the upper Midwest. The uh, uh, temperature data uh, comes from national weather statistics, uh, average annual temperature, which uh, influences the biological activity that, that uh, results in methane production. Uh, <clears throat> we have uh, state level, uh, actually it's, it's available at a higher resolution, but we have state level statistics on the number of animals produced by state, and we calculated a weighted sum of the emissions. Uh, the reason we chose those areas, uh, fairly obvious. Uh, from this map of where uh, animals are raised. There are some differences between regions. Uh, if you notice this green one is the manure, it gets uh, smaller as we go uh, eastern, western, and upper midwest. Uh, this is uh, largest because there's more anaerobic lagoons and we've already seen that that's uh, an important contributor. Uh, this is a little bit lower because the temperature actually is a little bit lower and there's fewer anaerobic lagoons. Uh, these, while the ratio of anaerobic lagoon to pit systems is about the same, uh, the mean temperature here being 13 versus about 7 uh, causes a significant reduction in uh, methane emissions. Most of the rest of the things are the same except you'll notice that uh, this bar here for farm operation in the upper Midwest is a bit thicker and the reason for that is that we assumed 70 heating days to keep the, the animals warm in the winter compared to uh, 14 heating days here and 35 heating days for this one. <clears throat> so different propane consumption. What do we get? The uh, 10 regions that we had statistics on in terms of uh, hog numbers were, are shown here. Uh, and the heights of these bars is, is measured in, in millions of metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent. So it's a, it's a rolled up total for the entire swine industry uh, from cradle to grave. Uh, not surprisingly, uh, the regions that have more hogs have a higher, higher total contribution. The, uh, the EPA publishes a document, a, a greenhouse gas inventory for the United States, everything. And if you, if you compare uh, these numbers to the numbers that are published in that document, you'll find that these numbers are a bit higher. And the reason for that is that uh, we've included uh, production of feed, which they don't include, and we've also included processing, uh, retail, and consumption, which is not included in the EPA report for swine or other, other livestock or, or other different sectors. Okay, we're done. Well, almost. <clears throat> uh, clearly, manure management offers a large opportunity in the context of reducing greenhouse gas emissions, uh, possibly through the use of anaerobic uh, digesters, uh, which would be a, a double bonus because you don't emit the, the methane and you have the potential to either provide heat by uh, burning it or uh, some people generate electricity on site. Uh, consumption phase and retail, uh, together about 27 percent, they're important. I think, it's, I think it's important that that be communicated to, 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 to society so that, uh, you know, the guy goes to the store and says, oh boy, I don't want to buy that because it's got a high carbon footprint. Well, buddy, <laughs> you're responsible as well. Um, fuels and electricity are important, but they're not the really big opportunity, which seems to be in terms of greenhouse gases, um, manure, still uh, improving efficiencies uh, can help reduce the, both the carbon footprint and improve the, uh, uh, the bottom line because you have to pay less to produce uh, the, the swine. 
Uh, and, and when I started this, I really thought processing, because I mean, those are pretty big plants, I really thought that, that they would have a, a much larger contribution. Uh, they're pretty efficient, it turns out, uh, per kilogram processed, but they do consume uh, an awful lot of energy, and I know that they're always working on improving their efficiencies, uh, and so even though it, it, it uh, doesn't offer a huge opportunity for reducing the carbon footprint because it's not that big of a contributor right now, uh, it's still an important area to uh, pursue. What's next? The third phase of our work is a detailed analysis of live swine production from the field to the farm gate. It'll offer a more granular evaluation of the product production practices. We kind of lumped things together to date. Uh, we anticipate that it will offer uh, opportunities to identify uh, other places for energy savings on the farm. It will be constructed uh, from process-based models calibrated against reported information uh, that we hope to collect through questionnaires. What, what this means is that, for example, we'll have a model that says if you've got insulation with uh, R14 uh, and your ventilation rates are this and the outside temperature is that, we'd, we'd write the, the models that say this is what we expect the energy consumption to be under those circumstances, and then if you increase your insulation, we'd be able to say this is what you would expect to save. 